my question is that how do you read uh, fixed income markets and uh, uh, what is your views and can you throw some more lights on uh, the way it is shaping up in India? Yeah, sure. what do you mean? Sorry for the disruption. No worries. So we are discussing about the size of the market and I was saying mm -hmm. that <clears throat> as compared to equity, the amount of debt that is needed is a few multiple times that. And that's what we see globally as well. So the size of the market is huge. Uh, today, like you mentioned, in terms of when somebody saves money, where does that saving go? Initially, it goes into fixed deposits in a bank. Right? Uh, that is one channel. Then <clears throat> savings might be in mutual funds, whether in equity mutual funds or debt mutual funds. Uh, it would be in insurance. People pay premium and also invest in ULIPs which also use for investments that is also in debt. So these are three, four large providers of capital in the country. So the bank market is over 100 lakh crores. Like you said, the equity market in terms of mutual funds is about 40 lakh crores. Uh, the insurance market is also 30 to 40 lakh crores. So a large part of this primarily is invested in debt, right? That is where the fixed income market largely is. It is used to finance everybody from a large company whether they're large companies or Reliance or a large company like HDFC or a small company, which you may or may not uh, know about, uh, which is probably only having 100 or 200 crores uh, of turnover every year. Right? A bank will finance that or uh, asset management companies such as ours will finance that. So that is the kind of size of the market uh, that you had referred to. And uh, hence, fixed income occupies, uh, you know, the prime focus area for banks, NBFCs, a large part of insurance and to some extent in mutual funds as well. Uh, while mutual funds don't really invest much in credit, they invest largely in the government's uh, borrowing as well as in the AAA kind of investments. Sure. So I have a couple of more questions on this. Uh, uh, and before that, uh, there is one question uh, which you just want to uh, throw uh, in terms of understanding. Uh, when you look at globally, Ravi, your the total size of equity market has now reached to 90 to 93 trillion uh, dollars. You know when, and when you look at the fixed income portion, that is almost one and a half times or 1.7 times more than the total size of the equity uh, exposure. So, uh, do you think that the entire globe? And this is something a different question than the subject, but I am just asking you. Since you are here and I have the privilege of asking you this question because you analyze various economies as well. Do you think the entire Europe or US market is going in big time trouble because they are they're, they're, they're borrowing more money vis-a-vis -vis, if you look at emerging market more especially uh, India our ratio is well maintained over to you. Because that's a great question. I think that's uh, the subject of a lot of opinion pieces right now as well in terms of uh, uh, what you refer to in terms of borrowing money is in a sense uh, central banks printing money. Right? And uh, in fact, you need to have a little bit of a historic uh, perspective towards why so much money has been printed. Uh, the biggest event uh, an economic event in uh, the United States of America happened in the 1930s or 1928, which was the Great Depression, uh, where uh, <clears throat> a lot of markets kind of froze up because the uh, amount of money was pulled out of the system. And uh, one of the big learnings uh, for a lot of uh, people who went to uh, economics courses later on uh, in over the next few decades was that during the depression, uh, if only the government or the reserve bank at that time had pumped in money, then the economic crisis could have been avoided was one of the big lessons. So to prevent that from happening, uh, the American central bank has taken to print money every time a recession is around the corner or if there is a economic event, which is threatening, uh, you know, <clears throat> poor economic growth. Uh, is around the corner. So whether it was in 2001 when the housing uh, bubble was about to break, uh, whether it is in the great financial crisis in 2008 or whether it is uh, after COVID, after each of these events, the central bank has been printing money and hence borrowing. So the size of their balance sheet has grown by more than 15 times over the last 20 years. So they are the biggest you can say uh, bet in town in terms of the amount of money that they have pumped into the system 
now when a lot of money gets printed uh, a, a lot of this finds its way towards asset markets right? and uh, whether it is equity whether it is debt whether it is something like paintings whether it is uh, auctions money finds its way across all of these kinds of asset classes and for some time it flew it went into cryptocurrencies as well right? so a lot of this printing has happened uh there is a big difference between the ability of developed banks to print money versus uh banks of developing countries to print money because we will print an inr we are dependent on the external world to give us dollars in exchange for that inr and we are running a deficit whereas the developed world by which i mainly mean the united states of america print certain us dollars and hence while the borrowing is unsustainable in the amount that they have printed and like you said uh, this means that they could be heading for trouble in theory you can keep printing your way out of it as long as inflation is under control it's only now when inflation has jumped and is now higher than india that the consequences of this are coming through and there is some tightening happen and with with that tightening you're finding that a lot of equity markets around the world are feeling the pressure around this so debt has definitely increased because of this printing uh, and like you said it's more than one and a half times the amount of equity but that debt has flown into equity markets as well which has also led to an increase in equity right? so equity has also increased on account of this debt and hence uh, the developed world is looked at very differently as compared to the developing world today if you compare in india uh, inflation is largely in control it has not gone uh, crazy right if you compare say uh, the united states where inflation was less than 2% for the longest time and now is at 7 to 8% it's it's a forex kind of increase whereas in india inflation is still at about the 6 to 7% kind of mark right and it had gone as low as 4 to 5% so inflation is not out of control a large part of inflation is with respect to food a basket which were largely self sufficient and on but we are still forced to raise interest rates to keep the macro economic stability because the developed world is raising rates and hence the rbi is increasing rates more out of making sure that it can defend the currency and not be out of whack with what the developed world is doing as compared to uh trying to fight inflation here uh, if you compare with what the us is doing so uh, that's the current situation while the printing is happening uh and now there is the reduction of that in terms of uh, <clears throat> both printing money as well as uh, buying back a lot of these assets which they had uh, expanded their balance sheet on uh the effects for developing economy is that uh, you have to tighten alongside coming back to our uh, discussion in the agenda today so uh, you know as an investor my question is very simple that you have two ways of investing in fixed income one is you can very well go through your mutual fund route where uh, you spend good amount of time and you know these are the, you have debt funds you have uh, short term fund and long term fund etc and the way is now unconventional way is this aif shaping up in india and through aif this fixed income opportunity Uh, is well witnessed, I would say, and uh, uh, and they are able to deliver the deliverables in the hand of investors. If you look at last few years, of course, you are the first one to start that, and obviously there are other players who are also picking up in the same lines. So, uh, can you talk to us, talk to our investors, and tell them more about? It? Sure. So, <clears throat> everybody has invested in debt uh, in the past, while they may not have. Uh, no called it as a debt investment because uh, everybody is used to bank fixed deposits right either uh, you would have invested in that or your parents would have definitely invested in that uh, and your grandparents would have invested in that everybody would have heard of indira vikas patra kisan vikas patra double your money in 5 years 7 years these are all debt instruments right these are accrual kind of instruments uh, and so are fixed uh, deposits the problem is when we try to look at the same kind of product which we are used to in a mutual fund setup right so uh, 
if you just allow me, I'll share one slide, uh, which can. Sure. Uh, showcase this um can you see my can you see the slide because are you able to see the slide uh not yet uh just go to screen share and then Yeah, I can see that now. Yes. Yeah, you're going to see this slide, right? Yeah. So <clears throat> I just have this one slide which is very simply laid out in terms of what is fixed income investing, right? So how do you what are the risks that one carries uh, when they invest in a fixed income instrument? And then we'll come to the actual uh, you know, the vehicle to invest. On how do you invest, whether you use a mutual fund, whether you use an AIF, like you said, or you invest uh, directly. All of this is to mitigate these three risks. Right? So one is obviously that uh, you have to look, look at fixed income investing as giving a loan. Right? You are lending money to something or someone. Uh, in a bank FD, you are lending money to the bank. Now, we typically don't think of giving money to a bank as a loan to a bank. But in effect, that is exactly what it is. You are giving a loan to a bank and you're hoping that the money comes back and the bank does not. Uh, you know, fall down, uh, does not default uh, because most of the banks are uh, governed very well uh, and uh, a large part of them are also owned by the government. Uh, we are running fairly low levels of risk. So it's very low risk, but it is still a risk. So, <coughs> so that is the primary risk, right? That is a downgrade or a default risk that you will not get the money back. Now, there are two other risks which come to investing in fixed income. One is called market risk. Market risk is basically saying that uh, how will the money behave from the time that I have lent to what I will get back. Right? So let me give you an example. Suppose that you invest 80 rupees in a bank FD and the bank says that at the end of three years or at the end of four years, I will give you back a hundred rupees. <coughs> now, uh, if you were going to get from 80 to 100 in four years, for simplicity's sake, assume that at the end of year one, you'll get 85. At the end of year two, you'll get 90. At the end of year three, you'll get 95. And the end of year four, you'll get 100. So that is how the money is going to grow over the next four years. Now, Market risk is the volatility in this movement. Right? So what that means is that instead of growing from 80 to 85 at the end of first year, suppose it only goes to 83 right? and you're two rupees short by the end of the first year. You know that at the end of fourth year, you will get 100. But at the end of first year, you have only uh, counted as 83 rupees. So that is the risk that you're carrying with a external movement in interest rates. As long as you're holding till maturity, you're holding till four years, you will still get back your 100. Right? But if you want to exit in the middle or if you want to enter in the middle, you're running this market risk. The third risk is liquidity risk, <clears throat> which is saying that if I want to prepay or sorry, I want to pre-close the FD, what return will I get or will I get a return at all? Right? Because then you have to go and sell the uh, fixed deposit in the market because in a bank FD, these risks are not there. That is why we are comfortable investing in this kind of product. Right? You know that uh, if I invest for four years, uh, even if I redeem after one year, I will get the one year equivalent interest rate. I may not get the same rate, but I will get the uh, prevailing FD rate at that, uh, at that one year time. So I'm okay. And there is no real market risk because it's not a traded instrument, but these are the two risks which investors don't really understand as much when investing uh, via a mutual fund. And mutual fund as a product uh, is meant to appeal to a large section of the population. Almost everybody uh, should be able to invest in the mutual fund given the small ticket size. And hence, uh, it's a very standard product. It's similarly defined for equity versus for debt. That whenever you put a redemption, on a T plus three or a T plus five, you should be able to 
uh, exit that particular investment. Right? No, so I'll just stop sharing. So <clears throat> those are the two risks that uh, somebody carries. Uh, what we've seen in mutual funds is that in India, the market for selling fixed income is not very liquid. So think of it something like a small cap or a penny stock. Right? You cannot go and sell on any day that you want or get the price that you want. Uh, some days the liquidity may be there. Sometimes it may not be there. And usually in uh, fixed income in India, the liquidity is not there. It's only there on a uh, sovereign papers or a government security or some triple A's, etc. So that is the risk that you're running uh, in a <clears throat> open-ended mutual fund where you can remove your money anytime. The second risk you're running is on market risk. Well, like I said that uh, at the end of one year, the money has only grown to 83. So then other people will come invest at that 83. Right? <clears throat> and if interest rates move such that uh, the, the accrual go, can go even lower right? because there is no end date. There is no end of uh, saying that there's a four year tenor. So uh, as a structure or the vehicle, uh, the mutual fund is not very convenient uh, for fixed income unless if you look at a structure like a FMP, a fixed maturity plan, because that takes away both the liquidity risk as well as the mark to market risk where you're actually investing for a certain period of time and it also has tax advantages. The AIF uh, is a similar structure than the mutual fund in the sense that the uh, regulator, which is SEBI, came up with regulations, but offered a lot more flexibility in terms of how you want to structure uh, the product. Right. So because we work in fixed income, <clears throat> we are able to structure uh, a product which is more uh, suited to a fixed income investment where you're taking credit risk, where you want to run high returns, right? So <clears throat> we will run products which are uh, which double your money in five years or four years or six years, depending on the kind of risk that we're taking in the product uh, without offering an exit in the middle because we cannot go out and sell those papers. Right? You can sell the units, but you cannot sell those papers. And hence, uh, alternate investment funds are useful uh, when you want to cover some of these risks. The other aspect to really look at for fixed income is that what is the first thing that comes into mind when somebody says that we want to invest in debt or equity? When you want to invest in debt, the principal thing is that I want my money back. This is my money that is not meant for risk. Right? When it is equity, I am ready to take that bet that I can get unlimited returns and I can probably lose capital as well. Right? An investor comes with that mindset. But in fixed income, the mindset is always that I need to get back my principal and some returns, depending on the kind of risk that we're taking. It's like now, they're just saying that if you have liquor, you're supposed to get a kick. But if you have coffee and if it gives you kick, then your need is not acceptable. And that is what has happened in ILNF is also. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Right. Exactly. I think that's a great analogy. <laughs> Because I'm going to use that for uh, some of my meetings afterwards. Huh? <laughs> so <clears throat> with fixed income, the problem is that uh, if you're giving a loan to only one person, so suppose I have 100 rupees to invest and I have given a loan to uh, person A. Okay? Now, if the I have done all the assessment, that person A is my neighbor. I know that person for last 20 years. I have seen their behavior. I've seen them pay their bills on time. They pay the society bills on time. Uh, they have a family. The intent is not to cheat. Uh, highly educated person and hence probably will be able to earn money in the future and hence will be able to repay my money. So I've done my credit assessment, right? I found the governor, the ability of the person to repay, the intent to repay, and hence I have given a loan. Something happens, there is a calamity or uh, I didn't know that the person had a gambling addiction and, you know, spent my money towards uh, an unproductive use and I could not get my money back. Right? So that is a risk that you're running when you're giving a loan to one person. Like that. Even if you've done all the kind of assessment uh, that you like and you think that it's a good credit worthy investment. Now, suppose that instead of giving 100 rupees to one person, at say 10% interest rate, who was supposed to return it at 110 at the end of one year. I give one rupee to one person and I give one rupee to 100 such people. Right. 
each of them is supposed to return I will still get back my principal because on each person I am only losing. I have lost ten rupees of principal. That is the <clears throat> mitigant to credit investing. You need to be able to spread your loans. You need to be able to give loans to multiple entities so that you are adequately diversified. So here in equity, it's opposite. If you diversify too much, if one company does extremely well, then the fact that the other companies did not do as well will lower your returns at a portfolio level. But in fixed income, when you diversify at a portfolio level, your risk is contained by diversification. The only way to diversify is to have a good fund size. The only way to have a good fund size is if you have a manager, an investment manager who can raise funds, has done these funds in the past. And is then able to deploy. So that is what uh, Northern Arc brings to the table. We have we are launching our tenth fund right now. Uh, fund size is over thousand crores. Each investment is at twenty crores. So if you're going to earn ten percent plus interest every year, even if one company fails every year, you will still lose only one or two percentage points of return. You will not lose principal. So that is the basics of fixed income investing. You have to approach it very differently. As compared to equity, you have to look at the investment manager, and you have to look at where they are investing, and what is the level of diversification, and what is their track record in being able to appraise those loans. And there is there is always the chance that some investment or the other can grow bad, but it should not impact you such that there is any kind of impact on your principal. And that is what we've successfully done so far. So, can you tell us more about Northern Arc Investment Managers? What's your investment capabilities, your process, and your track record so far? Uh, if you if you look at since inception. Sure. So let me just again pull up the slide. The so some things are better explained with just numbers. Yeah, yeah, and some of our investors have requested this particularly. They would like to see how what sort of returns have been generated so far. So hopefully, you can see my screen. Yeah, very much. Yeah. So Northern Arc uh, <clears throat> has been there for ten plus years, and uh, we've been featured as one of the most consistent uh, top performing. Private debt managers. Private debt is basically debt to private companies. Uh, we've been featured in Impact Assets 50 <coughs> consecutively, and uh, we have invested and helped others invest more than one lakh crores uh, since the over last 10 years across 250 plus companies. Right? And we have more than 500 investors so far. Um, this is our track record in terms of uh, the investments that we've done. Like I said, we are just about launching our tenth fund. Uh, <clears throat> we have, and out of the nine funds, we have uh, four funds have already matured in the sense that four funds have uh, raised money, invested money. Uh, we have monitored those investments, ten active calls, uh, and returned the principal plus uh, returns to all the investors across all of those funds. These are all absolute return funds targeting twelve to fifteen percent. Uh, except one product, which is an open-ended fund, which is targeting more nine to 10 percent kind of returns. Uh, and oh, sorry, <clears throat> Ravi, one question here, when you say one lakh crore of support, can you uh, give us more details about that? So what support sure. that you've extended? Yeah. yeah. So uh, Northern Arc follows uh, this principle of uh, skin in the game, where we find companies and we invest in them with our own capital. And once uh, the entities and the companies start demonstrating the ability to repay. Right? So take my earlier example that <clears throat> I've invested, uh, I gave money to uh, or lent money to my neighbor right, for the first time. Now, <clears throat> that was my own money. Now, if that person has successfully repaid right, and then 
giving another loan to him at that time i can also invite others to participate uh, and give a loan to that person right uh, while also lending myself right so we help uh, channel finance towards companies uh, the other companies that also lend along with us are all the banks insurance companies mutual funds uh, nbfcs overseas investors dfi such as nabard sidb etc and all family offices all these kind of investors also invest knowing that northern arc has invested so when you total uh, all of these amounts uh, our own investments has been about 10 to 15000 crores and the other companies investments uh, through us uh, has been about 85000 crores so that's the breakup Understood. So, in terms of uh, just the funds, uh, we have more than five thousand crores of commitments raised. Uh, we have repaid more than one and a half thousand crores across uh, these four funds, and current uh, assets under management are over uh, three thousand crores. Uh, we invest across the board uh, in financial service companies and non-financial service companies, uh, targeting anywhere from twelve to fifteen percent kind of returns. investors in our funds are largely institutions uh, most of them are uh, based in india while we have uh, about 20 to 30% of our money coming from overseas uh, that is from us and europe and these are largely private insurance companies uh, all the top names uh, and then family offices uh, banks as well as nbfcs which have repeatedly invested across uh, all of our funds so that's uh, what northern arc has done so far uh, across the board and uh, we run products uh, uh, across the board so we run uh, products on the ai platform uh, alternate investment funds have different kinds of categories uh, there's category 1 2 and 3 uh, category 1 and 2 have a minimum investment period of 3 years okay. so we have a 3 year product where somebody cannot exit for 3 years and then we also have an open ended fund which is a one month product so the key thing in in the one month product is that the underlying investments are also short term because that is the only way you can repay the investors right i cannot take your money for one month and then in, give the loan to somebody for one year the loan also has to be for one month right so it, you have to match the uh, kind of asset horizon uh, <clears throat> on both sides so we have uh, both of these kind of funds on the af platform and we also have uh, funds on the pms platform which we feel uh, are more suited towards the listed uh, universe so we have an fmp kind of fund as well uh, and uh, we also have custom funds that we do on the pms platform so that's just the kind of choice that we run uh, towards investors because when you have investors ranging from uh, hnis uhnis family offices uh, development financial institutions overseas investors Uh, nbfcs banks uh, <clears throat> insurance companies then the same product does not work for everybody so the ability to structure and innovate uh, has always been there in northern arc and we run different kinds of these products uh, we also have a feeder arm uh, in mauritius uh, which channels some of the offshore capital for us i have said you talked about which is you have cat 3 or uh, it's a cat 1 2 so you so one is that these are debt product which comes under cat 2 you also have shown one cat 3 so what is that correct so uh, we have category 1 2 and 3 uh, category 3 is a uh, open ended fund now in the alternate investment fund regulations uh, category 1 and 2 have a minimum investment period of 3 years so the fund has the money has to be invested for 3 years whereas in category 3 there is no such uh, restriction so we saw that there was a big gap in the market for investors which uh, had money to invest for anything anywhere from 2 months to 1 year but did not have an adequate market uh, product where they could invest and get inflation beating returns right most of the returns that if if somebody has excess money today and is say waiting for a market correction or is waiting for an event that they want to pay in 6 months time whether it is a marriage whether it is an education loan or uh, or sorry uh, an education for somebody who is going abroad there are several reuse cases but there is a lack of products at the short end that we can see uh, necessarily somebody only invest in either a liquid fund or an arbitrage fund 
uh, which does not give you uh, inflation beating returns. And hence, uh, <clears throat> with the vast experience that we have investing in companies and the fact that we have long-term investments in most of these companies as well, we devised a product which invests for a period of three to six months. Right? So that is the category three product. It's a highly diversified product where uh, the single investment, uh, single issuer concentration, investment concentration is somewhere around one to three percent. And <clears throat> investors can exit every month. So there is a, a period window at the end of the month where an investor can exit their investment. And the typical investment horizon is anywhere from three to six months. So that is the category three product uh, that we run. We are one of the uh, probably the oldest category three debt fund in India and probably one of the only ones as well, uh, which is running this. Kind of yeah, product. yeah. So I think it's it's kind of the open architecture where these are open ended, you know, you come within your three months, six months time, invest and take your money out whenever you. And this is also uh, the place where you can really understand the difference between a mutual fund and an AIF. Because if I want to run the same kind of product in an AIF, uh, in a mutual fund, then I have to offer liquidity on a T plus three kind of basis. Okay? Whereas in an alternate investment fund, I can structure the product such that liquidity is only available at the end of every month. That is when all of my investments are also maturing. So I'm using natural liquidity to pay the investors on a redemption i don't need to go and sell any paper in the market because the feature of the debt market the bug or feature whatever you call it in india is that the paper is not liquid when you go to sell there will be no buyer the buyer may come after three days after five days after seven days but if you want to do a distressed sale or an urgent sale there is no buyer in the market for fixed income and uh, yeah, I understood. So, and now coming back to Cat One. So, essentially, Cat One is more about startup investing, angel investing. So, what is this fund all about? Can you give us more understanding about that? Sure. So, uh, a lot of, uh, like I said, that there is a lot of uh, requirement uh, in the market for debt. Right? And uh, let me just put up this one slide which talks about the unmet demand. So a lot <clears throat> this demand was typically met by banks. But if you look at the table on the top left, a lot of the banks uh, have moved more towards retail lending or lending to individuals. And a lot of individuals have started borrowing as well. Uh, my parents never used to borrow uh, money. Uh, I have borrowed for a car and a home. But uh, yeah, we all the next generation, <laughs> next generation borrows for uh, anything from a smartphone to a vacation to uh, even a toaster, probably. Right. So the amount of borrowing and the acceptability of borrowing money has gone has increased significantly, <clears throat> and hence the segments such as uh, you know buy now pay later, personal loans, and all these kinds of financing have increased in the market. And a lot of banks and NBFCs have gravitated towards that, which is where there is a lack of financing options available for a lot of these companies, which are well run, are growing quickly and probably need a lot more capital uh, from working capital perspective or small uh, tenor capital needs anywhere from three months to three years. So that is the segment that we uh, are looking to target uh, with this uh, new fund that we've launched. Uh, this is a thousand crore kind of fund. And this will be investing across uh, logistics, uh, across B2B platforms, uh, across retail, across education, across healthcare, and across financial services and agri tech. So these are the kind of companies. Uh, so far, uh, we have already invested more than 2000 crores uh, in these segments uh, over the last six years. Uh, and we've not faced any kind of uh, default or any kind of issue across these companies. So uh, we are well, very comfortable from an underwriting perspective in terms of demonstrating that track record to an investor. Also, it's a good value proposition that you have a very diversified fund, which is yielding you 12, 13% kind of returns. And, uh, you know, on a tenor of uh, close to three years, and it's a cash flow throwing fund. So I think uh, from an investment perspective, uh, the underwriting 
from an investor value proposition perspective in terms of a highly diversified cash flow throwing short tenor fund uh, there is a meeting of all of these aspects uh, and obviously with a trusted uh, asset manager like northern arc we already finding a lot of uh, strong appetite uh, for this product as we go about uh, doing the launch this month last two questions before we conclude the session here so one is that obviously the investors are curious and they keen to know that you know what is it that you do that you you know tend to deliver much higher than the industry standard when you compare that vehicle with some of the other vehicles which exist in india a and b is uh, how has been the credit rating and is there any in house uh, sort of setup or capabilities that you do research or or how do you look at is what sort of risk which is involved here yeah. oh, that's an uh, that's the key point i think that's the value proposition that northern arc uh, brings to the table right uh, credit and investing is all about the kind of time and effort that you spend in uh, right, towards uh, assessing uh, <clears throat> whether the company or a person will repay uh, right from the corporate governance framework to uh, examining each and every facet uh, of the company so it requires a lot of time to be spent uh, you know at the premises when you work in a particular industry <clears throat> if you work with all of the players in that industry you will know the nuances of who is doing what and which one is better which one is worse now suppose i want to enter uh, into the mutual fund industry to invest as a person i will not be able to distinguish between fund manager 1 versus fund manager 2 or amc 1 versus amc 2 whereas with your experience and the amount of time that you spend and the amount of interviews that you've done and the performance that you've seen through cycles you will be able to identify the key aspects across each of these asset management companies simply by the fact that you have spent a lot of time analyzing researching <laughs> interviewing and taking exposure and investing across their products to know the uh, <clears throat> plus and minus of each kind of these companies and capabilities so that is what we do we take certain sectors we spend an inordinate number of time uh, in terms of assessing the <clears throat> pluses and minuses of the sector we evaluate every company within that sector to figure out what is the pecking order what are the companies which are good what are their uh, advantages over the others and then we invest in a few <clears throat> naturally what this means is that we cannot invest in every sector because we don't have that kind of i mean we don't have all the people in the world to invest in every sector so we don't invest uh, in sectors such as real estate or traditional sectors such as chemicals or steel or some of these other industries uh, we only invest in the sectors that we understand where we have done this kind of research and we put in the number of resources for this as well so we have uh, about 400 people at northern arc which are only doing uh, investing in these kind of sectors and in a few sectors if you compare that with the setup say with the mutual fund <clears throat> or with any other kind of setup in terms of the investment yeah. personnel it's more general and that's why they are investing in the higher rated credit where uh, you know, a lot of the information is publicly available you don't have to deep dive to such an extent whereas when we are investing and asking for higher returns then obviously the amount of diligence that needs to be done is a lot more so it's just about the amount of resources and the track record and the time that you invested uh, and the experience of doing it uh, which has kind of helped us deliver the performance that we have so far sure so last question so what sort of returns one can expect uh, from these instruments that we talked about sure so uh, you had also mentioned uh, something on the rating spectrum right uh, so the <clears throat> rating spectrum is from aaa to aaa b and the yields from aaa to aaa b vary anywhere from about 7% to about 14% or 15% kind of return. so that is the kind of range <clears throat> that you get so depending on where um, bulk of these investments lie which will be in the a or aaa b rated space the returns will be somewhere at a gross yield of about 14 to 15% and net investor returns will be about uh, 12 to 13% depending on the expenses now uh mutual funds uh, like you're very well aware sebi has been very very sharp in terms of the expense ratios that mutual funds have been allowed to charge right uh and there is not much room in that 
with an alternate investment fund because there is flexibility in terms of how you structure the product there is also flexibility in charging fees and we do see that uh, the fees are all over the place i'm sure uh, with the number of aifs that you look at uh, you would be well aware of the range so nodanak uh, charges fees commensurate with what mutual funds do we are one of the lowest charging uh, funds uh, we charge flat rates uh, typically anywhere from a 75 base points to 1.5% kind of returns uh, we don't charge any carry uh, carry kind of fees or uh, neither do we charge separate setup uh, etc kind of expenses and hence the risk that you take at a gross level in terms of the returns that you make at the portfolio level versus the returns that an investor gets after deducting the fees are very close to each other right unlike in other funds where the <clears throat> the return will be very high at the portfolio level but after cutting fees carry expenses etc and all the net returns can be uh, quite uh, sharply lower than what the gross returns were so <clears throat> for the long ended funds any at the 3 year bucket we target anywhere from 12 to 13% net returns to investors so after all fees and on the short tenor product which is the 1 to 3 month uh, kind of horizon uh, we target anywhere from uh, around 9 to 9.5% kind of returns Sure. So we'll open the forum for Q and A quickly, and I can see some some of them have already uh, sent their questions. The first question is: uh, Are you planning to come out with your own IPO? <laughs> so that's the first question. So obviously, uh, yeah. so we have uh, Nodanak has filed the uh, DRHP, and uh, we have received the approval from the regulator as well. and uh, yeah. beyond that hopefully uh, you will see us listed sometime <laughs> sure second question is what is the total amount of aum that you manage under aif platform sure uh, so <laughs> currently we have uh, asset under management yeah. Of... yeah so the aif platform currently manages over 3000 crores of uh, aum which is on books right now Uh, excluding the amount of one and a half thousand odd crores that we've repaid, there are additional commitments. The AIF works separately from mutual funds. That first investors have to commit, and then we have to draw down that capital. So if you look at it from a commitment perspective, uh, that will be around five hundred to one thousand crores higher. Where's your head office? So their head office is in Bangalore, right, uh, Ravi? No, uh, so uh, <clears throat> we have offices in all the cities, like you said, uh, Bangalore, Delhi, Chennai, and Mumbai. Uh, the two main offices are in Chennai and Mumbai. The oldest office is in Chennai, and uh, Mumbai is the other large office. For now, Bharat. So your investment team and you all based in Chennai, is it, or Bombay? No, we are uh, based in Mumbai. Yeah. Investment team is largely in Mumbai. Yeah. So with that, uh, there are no more questions. So with that, we'd like to conclude the session here. Uh, it was great uh, speaking with you, Ravi. We got to learn a lot today in terms of fixed income markets, instruments, and uh, the way it is shaping up. Uh, so thank you so much for taking the time out from your busy schedule and joining in today. It was my pleasure, uh, Vikas. Thank you for hosting this, and thank you for everybody that tuned in. Uh, hope to. Uh, be on this forum again sometime soon sure thank you everyone for joining the session today thank and uh, look forward to see you in uh, see you in person ravi whenever you come to pune uh, uh, please do definitely absolutely i intend to see you soon all right thank you thanks bye, bye.